Amidst plans for an educational cave exploration, a group of Boy Scouts embarks on an adventure led by Scoutmaster Donald Weltner and his sons, Christopher and Roger. March 27, 1982, dawned with excitement as they prepared for the day ahead. Joined by another Scoutmaster, Jim, they gathered their troop of 12 boys and established safety rules. Stick together, always have a buddy, and explore only cleared passages. Navigating the narrow passages of New Jersey's Crooked Swamp Cave System, the group encountered challenges, with ceilings as low as one foot. Excitement mingled with nervousness among the scouts. Donald, drawing from past experiences, anticipated varying reactions and ensured readiness to assist each member. Upon reaching the unassuming cave entrance after a hike, they prepared to venture into the unknown depths. Unbeknownst to them, this seemingly ordinary outing would soon take a catastrophic turn. Donald found himself trapped in a tight wedge at the bottom of a keyhole-shaped tunnel, just a few feet below the main path. Despite the short distance, his arms were pinned at his sides, rendering him unable to maneuver. With the path sloping down at a 30-degree angle and the slippery mud exacerbating his predicament, Donald's attempts to free himself only seemed to exacerbate the situation. Realizing he needed assistance, Donald called out to his son Christopher to grab his feet and attempt to pull him backward. Despite their efforts, the tight confines of the tunnel thwarted their attempts. Donald instructed the boys to retreat and fetch Scoutmaster Jim, confident that an adult's intervention would resolve the dilemma. Upon Jim's arrival, the challenging nature of the rescue became apparent. Donald's legs protruded from the passage at a 30-degree angle, making extraction difficult. Despite Jim's efforts, each tug only seemed to exacerbate Donald's entrapment, with the cave's narrow confines amplifying the struggle. Recognizing the need for additional help, Jim acknowledged the limitations of the space and the necessity of reinforcements to free Donald from his precarious predicament. It seemed unreal that his friend had just crawled forward into this tight spot, but now couldn't back out. Donald explained that some rocks had loosened when he slid, and it seemed that they were wedging against his body. Each time Jim pulled him back toward the passage, the rock slid forward and blocked the exit hole, squeezing Donald's body in the process. This was not a situation that the two men would be able to fix on their own. Pulling backwards was only pushing Donald into an impossibly narrow squeeze, and there was no way for Donald to move forward because he was pressed against the tunnel walls, which had narrowed to five inches just beyond his head. Donald was stunned to find himself in this position. Jim backed out of the tunnel and called for help. It had been nearly three hours since Donald had become stuck, and he had not moved an inch. The police put out the call for cave rescue specialists to assist in the tight tunnels. This wasn't the kind of space where a team of people could move in and rescue a stuck caver. The tunnel that Donald was stuck in was just big enough for one person to reach his feet at a time. The rescue teams got to work trying to rig up some ropes to pull him out of the tight passage. Even with the additional pull of several people, it only caused Donald to become more wedged under the ledge and rock keeping him trapped. The rescuers couldn't reach the rock that was blocking the path, and Donald's hands were trapped by his body in the narrow fissure he had slid into. Once they realized that pulling would not free him, they brought in the chisels and small jackhammers to try to move out some larger pieces of rock. This was painstaking work in the cramped space, with little progress to show for hours of work. Groups of two moved in and out of the passage to reach Donald and try to warm his body with a heat lamp and warm water bottles around his legs. They talked with Donald to assure him that they were going to find a way to free him. He felt completely helpless without the use of his arms and stuck under a rock that had broken free from the ceiling of this tunnel. Donald was cold and thirsty, but no one could reach his upper body to help alleviate his suffering. He asked them to call his wife and let her know he would be late tonight. The minutes and hours ticked by slowly for Donald while he thought about how he got into this situation. It's hard to grasp the isolation he must have felt in that small pocket of space, completely immobilized, physically trapped in every way possible while being able to freely think, breathe, and talk. It was a frustrating nightmare that seemed to drag on and on. Cavers, who knew the system well, were aware that the other cave met this tunnel just near where Donald was stuck, 
They entered from the other side and explored until they found a passage that led directly to this tiny tunnel. But only the smallest cavers could squeeze into this passage. Two sisters who joined the rescue effort were exactly what was needed to reach Donald. Lynn and Nancy Taylor were experienced cavers whose parents had led the way through a lifetime of cave exploration. They were also members of the National Cave Rescue Commission. They were 24 and 25 years old, but their size was the most important advantage they brought to this situation. Nancy was 5 foot 2 inches weighing 105 pounds, and Lynn was 5 feet tall and weighed only 86 pounds. Lynn used her tiny frame to wiggle through the extremely small passages in Cave 2. She reached the area where they linked together, but it was a mere 5 inches wide in this location, reaching as far as she possibly could. She was unable to reach Donald's head. It was a winding, cramped little opening that kept her about two feet away from reaching him. They were devastated to see that reaching him from that side was not going to be possible. This left the rescue team unable to offer him warm water or nourishment of any kind. Clearly, the timeline for a rescue just got shorter. All through Saturday night, they tried one way and then another to free him. But it was clear Donald would not be pulled back out nor moved forward. They would have to try something else, knowing that time was limited. They called in a different kind of rescue team. They started digging, hoping to break through to the part of the tunnel where Donald was stuck. It took the entire day on Sunday to get close to the right depth. Unfortunately, they were about 12 feet away from the target tunnel. They continued to try to reach him by digging laterally to find a way to connect to the passage. By Sunday night, he had been trapped for 36 hours in a downward angle position. It was only 57 degrees inside the caves, and attempting to keep him warm was a serious challenge. Up to this point, they had been using a heat pump to blow warmer air toward him, and some hot water bottles touching his legs where he was exposed. This was the best they could do, since a very limited portion of his body was exposed on their end. Unfortunately, this air heat is no match for the cold stone that was pressed against his body. The risk of exposure and hypothermia is greatly increased in situations where cavers are touching the rock surface. Late on Sunday at nearly 2 in the morning, they heard grunting responses from Donald. They knew that he was suffering from hypothermia, but he was still alive. This inspired the rescue team to redouble their digging efforts to reach his tunnel by Monday morning. They were getting close but encountered extremely difficult bedrock areas that were impossible to simply dig through. They were starting to think that Donald might not survive this effort. It had been nearly two days of being trapped with no food, no water, and constant cold exposure. A nurse was sent down the main tunnel with a handheld Doppler machine, an EKG, to determine Donald's status. She was unable to get a pulse with either instrument, but she only had access to his cold legs below the knee. It would not be a 100% confirmation of whether he was still hanging on or not, because the core organs can still function long after the extremities have stopped registering a pulse. Knowing that the situation had just become more dire, they moved to use the most extreme methods available, including dynamite and a backhoe. It was risky, but if they didn't get to him quickly, there was absolutely no chance of his survival. On Tuesday morning, they had finally reached his location and a doctor was sent down to confirm what was long suspected. Donald Wellner had died. He just could not survive 72 hours in these extreme conditions. The team continued their work to recover his body, though this would not be a simple task. Once they actually reached his location, it still took an entire day to recover his body. The passages were jagged, and the ropes and slings were not a simple lift to get him free. The 150-person rescue team put in a heroic, 80-hour effort to rescue Donald Wellner. Despite their best efforts, the freakish nature of this accident prevented Donald from escaping the grip of the cave. His autopsy later confirmed that he died of hypothermia and exposure sometime between Sunday night and Monday morning. He survived these grueling conditions for at least 36 hours and maybe as long as 48 hours. After Donald's death, the cave system was locked for limited access. A conservancy group now only allows access to groups who meet two requirements. They must be experienced cavers and have membership in a recognized caving organization. 